So in spite of the boots, no, I am not with the band. So when I got the news that I had been accepted to give this TEDx talk and I started telling my family and friends that I was going to be doing a TEDx, they would say, oh, that's awesome. Where? And I'd say, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And they'd say, eh? <laughs> and then I got here and I started introducing myself to people and they'd say, where are you from? And I'd say, Corvallis, Oregon. And they'd say, eh? So I thought you might like to know how it is that I ended up here we can thank my friend Augusto Pinaud, who is a TEDx alum from here at Fort Wayne. My friend Augusto invited, scratch that, insisted that I apply. And I'm really glad he did. When I've been telling people about the book that I just finished writing and the three destructive myths about time, which are right smack in the middle of these um, three destructive myths. So the helpful person that keeps advancing to the picture, stop. <laughs> Mwah, love me. Okay, thank you. I won't want that slide, just not now. Okay, where were we? So when I've been telling people about these three destructive myths about time, and been telling them about my book, people have been saying, you should try to give a TED talk. So here I am. Now, I have a couple of confessions to make to you. I don't normally get nervous before I give talks, but I'm a little weege a bit jacked up for this one. And I'm also just a wee bit sleep deprived. Now, those things combined together have left me with a complete terror and fear that I'm going to somehow in the middle of this talk forget one or more of these three destructive myths about time. In spite of the fact that I've actually written a book on this topic. So I'm going to get them out of the way first thing so that I can settle myself down. The first of the three destructive myths is I will have more time later. And the second is, see, there it is. There's that blank space. Time is outside my control. That's my helpful plant, also known as my husband. And the third myth is my time is precious. So now that we have those out of the way, I want to jump back a little bit and tell you about why I think this material is really important. And in fact, you're, you've really been hearing about why this information is important all day. And I'm also going to let you in on a little dirty secret about time, time management, work productivity, coaching as sort of a subject area. While time management and work productivity folks tell you that they want to help you to make more time, what they really mean is they want to help you to make more time to do more work. And that is not what I'm about. I'm about helping you to make more time to do more of what you love with who you love. I think this is a vitally important distinction that we learn how to make good use of our time that we see our time in a different light, but that we use that knowledge in the service of what we're passionate about and the people we care about. There's this phrase that I've heard for a long time. You've probably heard it too. Either everything matters or nothing matters. Everything matters. Every small act you carry out, every moment that your heart is moved with joy or caring or love or compassion, that matters. You matter. What you do matters. Even those very small acts of kindness, of the moment of seeing the barista and making eye contact with her and being polite to her, because you may be the only person that makes eye contact with her and is polite to her and sees her as a human being all day long. Every small little thing you do matters. You matter. And what you love matters. And there are four people particularly I want to call out. One of them is Bernadette. Bernadette's going to change the paradigm of recovery. Rob is going to change the paradigm of what it means for people to drop out of school. <laughs> of 
Courtney is going to change the paradigm of inclusion. She's going to change the paradigm. I saw people during the break in a different light from hearing Courtney's talk. My perspective was altered. It only took her 18 minutes to alter my perspective. And then the last person I want to mention is Nicole. One thing you'll learn about me if you hang around me very much, I get a little teary at times, especially when I'm sleep deprived. <laughs> Nicole is going to help change the paradigm of what it means to take care of our girls. <laughs> what you love matters but not if you cannot make time for what you love. And so that brings us to these three destructive myths about time, because this is really all about identifying these myths, rejecting them, and then using that knowledge to make more time, not to do more work, but to invest it in what you love and with who you love. So here's this first myth. There will be more time later. Now, psychologists that study this belief of more time later, refer to it as resource slack. Time is the resource, and slack is this anticipated, imagined surplus of the resource sometime in the future. People are very accurate in their estimates of the resource slack of time for the immediate future. So the next two weeks, you know that your calendar is quite full. You already know that you're quite busy. You don't even have to look at your calendar to know that. But if you imagine six months, a year from now, you imagine that it's going to be less busy than now is. It never is less busy. The future is always just as busy as the now is. So there's actually not more time later. And furthermore, there really isn't any such thing as later. There is only now. So if we're going to have enough time, we have to have it in the now. So how do we do that? For many of us, this sounds like an impossible problem to solve. But it's actually not, because when we bump up against the second of these three destructive myths, which is time is outside my control, we learn that while it is true that none of us can control the ticking of the clock, the seconds go by at a very predictable rate, our brains actually manufacture our experiences of time. This is from neuroscience. And I especially spent time studying the work of neuroscientist David Eagleman. Now, David got interested in this problem when, as a small child, about 10 years old, he fell off of a roof. And he noticed that it took a very long time to get to the ground. And he remembers very distinctly this long fall from what was actually not a very high distance. And he began to ask himself, did time actually slow down? So he conducted many experiments to establish that one, during traumatic experiences, even though it feels as if time gets much slower, it actually does not, but that our brains actually add a very predictable amount of extra time to our perception of time. Our brains are manufacturing our experiences and our perceptions of time. And here's one of the way that, ways that that works. Our brains use the amount of details that are being written into memory as a way of estimating how quickly time is passing. So in a traumatic event, if you've ever experienced a wreck, or you've watched some priceless object that belongs to your mom that used to belong to your grandmother and it's plummeting toward the floor because you dropped it, and you know that it takes a very, very long time before it shatters into a million pieces and then your mom whoops your ass. <laughs> and you have time to anticipate every single second of her hand contacting your bottom. Yes, but I'm not speaking from personal experience. I'm, in any event, when our brains take in many, many details of our experience and write those details into memory, our brains assume that time is passing more slowly. 
Conversely, the opposite is also true. When time is going by very quickly, that's often because we're taking in very few details and very few details are being written down into memory. When I learned this, one of the first things I started telling my clients is slow down. And I started trying to teach them mindfulness as we learned from, from um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to look at your name because we know sleep deprivation, all that stuff. Dave, thank you. So we know that mindfulness helps us take in more and more details. The more details our brains write down into memory, the more slowly time seems to be moving. But what do most of us do when we feel like we have more to do than we can get done? We start to rush. But this actually exacerbates the very problem that we're trying to flee from. You know, when I thought about doing this TED Talk, and I made such a big deal out of it, I imagined getting up here and going blank. <laughs> so I guess what it is we practice is what we get. <laughs> so my time is precious. Thank you. So the third of these destructive myths, my time is precious. Now, this is the most counterintuitive of the three, because if we started to grasp that our time was precious, wouldn't we actually treat it with, with much greater respect? Wouldn't we actually use our time more effectively? There's some fascinating research by Sanford DeVoe and Jeffrey Pfeffer. And what their study showed is the more highly that people value their time in terms of a dollar amount, the more selfish they become with their time, the more impatient they are, and the more prone they are to frustration. This turns out to be a sort of a, a kind of entitlement where time is concerned. As we become more possessive with our time and we start to grasp it as being more and more precious, we start to feel entitled to having our time turn out the way we want to. Now, entitlement, a lot of us don't like to think of ourselves as entitlement. But entitlement is really sometimes not what we think it is. Sometimes we think of it as like we feel like we deserve special privileges or that we think that the world owes us something. But I'm thinking of entitlement in a slightly different way. Entitlement is when our feelings get very attached to our expectations. And our entitlements kind of get bonded to our expectations like Velcro. And then reality comes along and parts our expectations from our feelings. And often that parting of expectation from feelings can be quite painful. Now, nowhere is this more obvious when we're on an airplane, correct? Because people are already impatient, they're already upset, they're already stressed, and we can watch these impatient, stressed people as their expectations get violated, as reality sets in, and they start to experience all this pain. Now, there was a very, very interesting study that was conducted by uh, a guy named Ed O'Brien, who did this work at the University of Michigan while he was still a graduate student. He took a large group of students and he divided them into two groups. He gave both groups of the students the same boring, tedious survey to complete. The control group was told nothing about what the purpose of the survey was. They were only asked to take it, and then they were asked to estimate about how long it took for them to complete the survey. And they were very accurate in their estimates of how long it took to complete this short but tedious task. The second group of students, he primed them to feel entitled. And he did this in a couple of different ways. He repeated the study more than once. In the first version of the study, he told them that they were taking the survey because they deserved the best possible experience on campus. The second time he did it, he primed them to feel entitled subliminally. So he put words like deserve, better, best, and he flashed them on a screen too quickly for them to see. But the results were the same in both cases. The entitlement prime students significantly overestimated how long it took to complete the boring task. For them, time went by very slowly. So that goes back to our second destructive myth, that time is actually very much a perceptual event, an experience. But there was one more thing that happened. They were in a significantly faster hurry to leave the room 
They walked much faster as they were leaving the room than the non-entitlement prime students did. Now, why is this important to us? Now we get our ha handy slide. This information comes from advertising material that was in the seat back pocket on a major airline, and I've hidden which airline it was. We see that we're told that flight time is your time, so we're being encouraged to possess time as if it belongs to us. And then we've got some entitlement messages. Get exactly what you want from every flight, like that ever happens. And then first your flight, then the world, make the most of your time in the air, so it's your time with a premium experience that puts your needs first. Now, of course, we're all feeling very mellow when we get on the plane until the guy ahead of us slams the seat back and misses our very expensive electronics by just that much. And then the guy behind us is poking that screen with his finger, you know, for every two seconds, for five and a half hours. So, honey, since you're putting my needs first, don't pour me a glass of wine, just give me that bottle. I'm gonna need it, because time is gonna go by very slowly on this flight. I do really wonder, however, if customers who read these entitlement messages give lower satisfaction ratings to their flight experience. It would not surprise me if that were true. So we have these three destructive myths about time. And now you understand that these three myths are not true, even though some of them sound very truthy, especially that third one, my time is precious. So what is my hope? is that you will use this information to make more time for yourself. That you'll remember that the only time that you can have enough time is now. Now is the only time you have. That you will remember that you can control your experience of time. That your perception of time is very much what you think it is and what you say it is. And finally, that it's not that your time is precious or my time is precious, it's that all time is precious. That by treasuring every single moment as the sacred gift that it is, that we'll live richer and more fuller lives. Now, I don't have any data to support this, but I believe that gratitude is actually entitlement kryptonite. We're inundated with entitlement messages every day from the media, from social media. We hear constantly all these entitlement messages. But when we practice gratitude, when we actually make ourselves aware of the gifts that are poured out on us each and every day, these little moments, I just don't think that entitlement and gratitude can coexist. And by practicing gratitude, it alerts us not just to the gifts that we receive, but the gifts that we give others through our lives. Thank you.